A-R-U, Andy Raymond unfiltered. Got it bang on, baby. I think Samoa beat England. Uh, I, I think uh, in a terrific semi-final, and I think the Kangaroos beat the Kiwis in, a, in an equally as good semi-final. Uh, I think two flagships, and, and, and they should both be good. Dude, that is remarkable because they were double digits underdogs. Nobody but you and the Samoan people themselves were picking towards Samoa to beat England. Andy, welcome back. Well done on that, mate. Brilliant. And as a result, I haven't been eating baked beans on toast uh, for the last three days. I've been able to uh, stretch the budget a little for it. It was was a good weekend. It was a good weekend. (laughs) How did you pick that? What did you know that the rest of the world, the rest of the rugby league world didn't know? Uh, I, uh, I've i got this thing about uh, England starting tournaments well and they've done it going back to 1990 and when it gets really serious, the occasion gets to them. Uh, in particular, their halves. I, I, I didn't think their halves had what it take to, uh, to stand up and uh, control the game and control the pressure. Look, but they almost did. They almost did. And we've had two wonderful semi-finals that we should be celebrating. However, unfortunately, I'm, I've still got that little bad taste in my mouth from the first three weeks of the tournament. And um, and I'd love to see in the International Rugby League community come together and work out a better system that can actually promote the game in a better fashion for the next World Cup yeah, in, uh, in four years' time. Yeah, um, <clears throat> even if you had, uh, you know, the, the Tier 2 or Tier 3 nations battling their own little World Cup as a qualifier in a, on a different part of the globe, allowing another country to enjoy the qualification matches, still broadcast them, still hype them, but almost a separate tournament to gain entry with maybe the big five, six or seven sides. Yeah, look, T20 World Cup did it brilliantly, mate. And I know that, you know, you, you've got to have, a, you know, a lot bigger gap and rest days between you know, games of rugby league than you do the T20 cricket. But that build-in tournament was the just, it was the perfect, wasn't it? A lead into the T20 tournament. Samoa versus Australia. Okay. I thought that you deserved to win that semi-final against us. I thought the Kiwis didn't have a lot of luck, but we didn't play well in the second half. Um, yep. is, you know... This, this. I mean, you expect an Australian side, to, I don't know, Andy, to be a hell of a lot better. What, is that because the Kiwis are a lot better than we all thought that they would be? Or, or have we not yet seen the absolute best of this particular Aussie version? Combination, Marty, for me, absolute combination. Uh, the New Zealand side, far better than the, uh, it has been in, in years past, and a real platform to grow on. Gee, it's going to be a good footy side in a couple of years. I mean, a really good footy side in a couple of years. But I don't think the Australians have played anywhere near 70% of their capacity. And one thing that I will say about Mal Meninga, who has been often criticised as a coach, he has a successful record and his timing with the State of Origin sides was impeccable. They were always up for the third game, the final game, and the record there was outstanding. I am tipping the Australians to improve 30% this weekend, and I think it could be a long 90 minutes for Samoa. Kiwi fans versus Aussie. I think it was 10-8, was it the score in the in the first, was it the yeah. round-robin the round robin match? We're watching the highlights of our women yesterday. Good God, there's some bruising players in that team. I'm really looking forward to this game as well. How do you how do you see it? How do you see it rolling? Yeah, terrific, terrific game. And our dream game, isn't it? Yeah. Really. Uh the semi-final against PNG. Uh, that was an embarrassment, unfortunately. It was, you know, Well, it's professionals against amateurs almost, isn't it? It's hard watch, mate. Hard yeah. Watch. But it, it it doesn't grow the game. Again, I go back to growing the game and it look, it makes seventeen Australian players feel great. It makes a you know, a couple of tens of thousands of Australian supporters feel great, but no one wants to see 84, 80 nil, or even 30 nil. It doesn't do anything. I think this is a great game uh, coming up. The Aussie girls, they seem to have their, their timing right. Jeez, I'm glad you guys knocked off the palms in your second half. Was yeah. outstanding. <laughs> <Wonder. Wonder. laughs> Gee, it was good to watch. And the progression in the women's game has been nothing short of phenomenal in rugby league. These are these are little athletes now, mate. They're not, um, um, you know, they're not unfit girls. They're not uh, girls that couldn't play rugby or were no good at athletics. They are young women with all the athletic 
talent, ability and mental strength in the world. I'm looking forward to this. I think it'll be a great game. Brilliant. Andy Raymond Unfiltered, that's a man's podcast. That's who he is. He joins us every Wednesday. I tell you what, you know, my my heart skipped a little happy beat when 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 I read that the kind, compassionate, considerate Australian government had decided to reverse, you know, the the three year ban and let Novak back in. I know it's got nothing to do with the fact he brings headlines and he brings money and he brings you know ups the economy when it comes to the Australian Open, and they probably would have worn a lot of flag. I just thought it was just a lovely gesture at Christmas time. Lovely Christmas gesture. Now, <laughs> I, uh, I'm a guy that just absolutely hates mixing sport and politics because sport is our release, yes. it's our enjoyment, yes. it's our passion, yes. and politics is as boring as a chat with your mother-in-law. You know Let's it's be horrible, honest. mate. No, yeah, I know. I mean, apart from the New Zealand uh, Warriors, no one's, le- no one's turning down a contract to move back next to their father-in-law. Remember that, okay? Let's remember yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> That's exactly right. Mate, it's um, geez, it's a mind-boggling decision. And there are people on both sides of this argument in Australia scratching their head this morning. The, the, the ones that were supportive of the government are saying, what's changed? The ones that were supportive of Novak are now saying, what's changed? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. everyone is confused about what this actually means were they wrong? Were they right? Is it a backflip? And what does it mean to other people from other countries with um, with a suggestion they could have been exposed to the virus over the last 18 months and are having trouble coming back? I mean, uh, it is it is just crazy. It's, it's politics. Really the worst of politics, is. isn't it? That's what it actually is. It's just, you, you do, We all know why this decision has been made. The guy yeah, falsified funny. his entry papers. Now, you know, if you did that in America, there's no way you're getting back in again. He, he I believe he needs to be made an example of. There's no question about that. Having, having said that, when it comes to the tournament kicking off, I just want to watch him play tennis, mate. So I'm, I'm, I'm a totally, totally contradiction in terms with this. Imagine doing it in the States. A, you probably wouldn't have got out of the States. You would have just been locked up at Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> imagine, do, imagine doing this in Eastern Europe oh, at the moment no. where they're throwing missiles at each other. You would have been slammed in jail with no correspondence with the outside world and forgotten about for a decade. It's, uh, look, falsifying yeah, documents. Documents, falsifying that documents. That is yeah. huge. Yeah. I mean, it, it, what, it's the biggest no-no there is because since 9-11, this, the, this was brought in because of Osama. It's the terrorism thing. I mean, you're getting in under, you're getting in under false declaration. It doesn't matter whether you're trying to be somebody else, a false passport. But un, under those circumstances at the time, with COVID ravaged through Melbourne, this guy, you know, he had been very public about the fact that he hadn't been vaxxed and then just happened to tick a few wrong boxes because his mind just did it. Mate, I mean, and now to overturn, look, at the same time, do you agree you want to see him play, though? I want to see him play. Of course I want to see him play. He's a wonderful athlete, a wonderful tennis player, but what he's done is inexcusable in my eyes. He's also a prick of a person. He comes, well, I don't know if he is, but he comes across like that. Like, he's a very difficult yeah, guy. I like. agree. I love the way he plays tennis. Don't get me wrong. Yep. Let's talk about Ian Thorpe. Now, you know, this has reared its head again. I can't remember. Lachlan, can you please look up? I can't remember the name of the of the United States collegiate swimmer who all of a sudden um, won, a, won a national title in the States. It's, it's a man who's now a woman. And when you uh, see... Leah Thomas. There you go. Standing on the podium... You know, looking like looking like uh, Sam Whitelock compared to Aaron Smith, compared to the other swimmers there. Yep. What was number 568, 100 metres for men or 200 metres for men and ends yep. up winning that. And Ian Thorpe's now come out. I mean, and there were great arguments put about why uh, that, you know, in terms of the transgender thing and, and competing against female athletes, and I'm not being insulting to transgender people, all I'm saying is that competing against women who are women, who are biological women, who, who grew up as women and are women. There's something not right about it, and most of us feel like that. So why the hell has Ian Thorpe jumped this bandwagon all of a sudden? Uh, I, I don't know. I respect Ian as an athlete. I also respect him as a person. He, he is a terrific fella who has lived his own secret in the past, and, and whilst he's had a lot of headlines and a lot of great moments, no doubt there would have been some really difficult ones. So I do I respect his opinion. Uh, and I respect him as a bloke, but I think he's got it completely wrong. Now, before anyone listening decides that I'm homophobic, transphobic, or discriminatory, shut up. Just shut up. What I don't do, I don't bow to the minorities, which it seems is 2022. 
the year of bowing to the minorities. There is a difference between a biological man and a biological woman, and the two shouldn't meet on a sporting field. Once again, sport and politics don't mix. Leave it out. There is going to have to be a discussion at some stage. There's going to have to be a very brave and very clever discussion. That's not for me, but the way I see it, biological differences dictate that these two don't compete against each other. Do you know what I mean? I absolutely endorse that argument, mate, and and I'll add to I'll add this to it because this is this is my version of the argument: is the people that should decide are the women who who are competing. Now, if, if they, on yeah. mass, unanimous say, no, this is perfectly okay, then I'll butt the hell out of it, okay? Because it's it's not my decision to make. But those are the yeah. people that need to be asked first and foremost. Are you happy with this? Is it fair for you? And if, and if it's not unanimous across the board, it doesn't happen. That's, that's where I sit. It, it is going to be a heartbreaking conversation and debate whichever way we go over the next two or three years. I'm going to say in my lifetime, I didn't think we'd ever have to be having these type of discussions. I just, I didn't see this in the Andy Raymond crystal ball and, and it's, it's blown me for six. Um, but I, I, again, not discriminatory. There's a difference, but I do not see the personal satisfaction in a born male transitioning at any age then defeating females in their mid-twenties. How could you in your right mind sleep at night thinking that you didn't have an unfair advantage? Knock, knock. Who's there? The Wallabies. Oh, go next see, door. Go, go, go. See, see, that's just too easy. That's just that, that's shooting fish in a bucket. And, I mean, that's just way too easy, man. <laughs> Come on. Oh. Is Dave, can Dave Rennie hang until the World Cup? I mean, they're not going to get a point of after, after the World Cup. Can he hang until then? Um, yes. I, I, I think it has to. I think, I think they're too far into their campaign. Um, I think they're too far into their campaign to, to start making huge decisions. But, gee, there's going to be some conversations immediately after the World Cup, isn't there? getting done that historic loss to Italy uh, and then to bounce back, we've got the world number ones in Dublin this weekend. Um, it was it was miserable. It was borderline pathetic. It was embarrassing. Um, and maybe it's the bottom of the barrel. But I believe I've said bottom of the barrel three or four times over the last 18 months. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the Wallabies uh, historically have been a really consistent national side. Um, not consistently great, but their performances have been consistent. You, you always knew as a kid what the Wallabies were going to produce. And it may not have been a 10 out of 10 performance every international game, but it was an eight and a half performance out of 10 every international game. We've seen some nine and a half out of tens over the last 18 months. We've seen some three out of tens. And the difference between their best and their worst, to me, rings massive alarm bells, not so much for the players, but for the coaching staff and the coaches who are preparing them as a unit. But a coach's job is to prepare the individual mentally and physically to peak on that day at that time. And the coaches are not preparing these guys to be at their best. They're they're just not. And and the results tell us that. And and that's probably a bigger error than not being tactically sound or not having the best goal kicker or not having the best kick or, or running fly half. But the fact that they're not up mentally and in the best headspace they can be for one test match a week, I think that is a huge issue, mate. I, I really do. And look, if we're going to be honest, it's a bit of an All Blacks issue over the last four or five months too. <clears throat> We'd like to sweep that under the carpet, mate. Okay, yeah, no, I understand that. Hey, are you Andy Raymond Unfilter? What's on the podcast this week? Mate, good podcast. Um, former Bulldog and Warrior, the great Steve Price comes in and Steve drops Price. off his dream team. When yeah. I say dream team, his best 13 ever. And Steve thought doing his best 13 was ever, was easy. 
Then he said, can we make it 17? I said, yeah, not a problem. <laughs> not a problem. He said, actually, it's a, it's a touring squad. Right. We've got COVID. So he so named his yep. 20, yeah, named 30 players. We've got uh, a short collection of interviews with Dale Finucane coming up on um, on the podcast tonight. And then former Bulldog Lock, a guy that would be on a million a year at the moment, Travis Norton drops by on the weekend and gives us his eight guests for the perfect weekend session. So we're going to talk beers, we're going to talk barbecues, and which eight people, any era, any profession, dead or alive, you'd invite to your place for the perfect get-together. It is a cracking one. Andy Raymond unfilled it.